In the early 990s, Basil II began revealing his military capabilities. A stickler for discipline, the Emperor's endless inspections of his troops transformed them into a well-oiled military machine. This proved vital in the long campaign in Bulgaria, where Byzantine forces successfully conquered important fortresses in the enemy's heartland. However, by late 994, Basil was forced to leave the Duke of Thessaloniki in charge of the Western Army and head back to Constantinople. The Emperor's attention was urgently needed in the East. A Fatimid army under Governor Manu Takin had crippled local Byzantine forces, forcing Duke Michael Burtzis to retreat to Antioch. By autumn of 994, the important city of Aleppo was besieged by the Fatimid governor of Syria. The blockade caused severe food shortages, and the population was on the verge of surrendering. If Aleppo were to fall, the southeastern frontier would be exposed, threatening to erase three centuries of Byzantine progress in the area. Basil needed to act fast. Knowing that time is of the essence, Basil spent the winter recruiting and drilling the troops. Once the snow melted, the army made way to relieve Aleppo. Each man was mounted and had a spare horse or mule. The restless march was carefully planned and would become one of Basil's most impressive military feats. A journey from Constantinople to Syria that typically took two months was completed in 16 days. Basil's plan to surprise Manu Takin with speed worked. Outmaneuvered, the Fatimid general hastily burned his camp, lifted the siege, and left for his base at Damascus. With Aleppo saved without a single swing of the sword, Basil continued the campaign of 995 by reducing Fatimid gains in Syria and besieging the major Levantine port city of Tripoli. But back west, the newly appointed Duke of Thessaloniki, Gregory Taronites, proved utterly incapable of checking the advance of Emperor Samuel, and he was now holed up behind the walls of the provincial capital. He tasked his son Asotes with stopping the Bulgarian raids in the environs of Thessaloniki. Unfortunately for the Duke, his son was swiftly defeated and captured by Samuel. This obliged Gregory to sally forth, taking most of the city's garrison with him, and confront Samuel in battle. After winning a brief skirmish, the Byzantines chased after the retreating Bulgarians, only to be lured into an ambush. Gregory was cut down, together with most of his men. Word of the events in Macedonia quickly traveled to Syria. At Tripoli, Basil's attempts to encircle the city proved unsuccessful, as he could not blockade Fatimid naval supply lines to the fortress. Realizing he must head back, he lifted the siege and marshaled his army to Constantinople. But despite news of the setbacks in the west, Basil opted for a slow and deliberate march back home. Having not adequately visited Anatolia since childhood, the emperor used this opportunity to make his presence felt. On a vast estate at Caesarea, he was received by Constantine Melianos. A lavish feast was held for the entire imperial army until they finally went on their way. Along his itinerary to the capital, Basil continued appearing unannounced at the gates of powerful Anatolian aristocrats and for good reason. His reforms that aimed at aiding small landowners decreased the influence of the aristocracy, which undoubtedly displeased many powerful men. Thus, these friendly visits with the imperial army in tow went a long way in reaffirming any wavering loyalties to the emperor. Once in Constantinople, urgent matters of the state needed tending to, keeping Basil busy in the capital. Meanwhile, Samuel had inflicted another defeat, cutting short the career of Gregory's successor, John Caldos, after defeating and capturing him in yet another ambush. 
By this time, Samuel made ambushing Byzantine generals his trademark. Confident during the campaigning season of 996, he ventured deep into enemy territory with the bulk of his army, cutting a path of destruction as far as the Peloponnese. Word of the movements of a large Bulgarian army reached Constantinople. Basil sensed an opportunity to cripple Samuel in a single blow, now that his forces were concentrated in one place. The emperor appointed the relatively unknown Nikiforos Uranus as his new general in the west. His task was to harass and intercept the Bulgarian army on their way home. Moving ever closer to the Bulgarian frontier, Samuel was lured into a false sense of security after he forded the river Spurtsios, which swelled after several days of heavy rain. Encamped close to the river and confident that Oranus would not be able to cross it, Samuel neglected to conduct a proper watch over the Byzantines on the opposite bank. Unbeknownst to the Bulgarian leadership, on July 16th, Oranus discovered a ford in the river. The Byzantine army crossed to the opposite bank at dusk and headed towards the enemy camp. Oranus carefully arrayed his troops in pitch black so as to not arouse any suspicion. In a masterfully executed night attack, the Byzantines achieved total surprise. A chaotic melee followed, and the unprepared Bulgarians were crushed next to their encampment. According to some sources, Samuel and his son, Gavril Radomir, evaded capture by lying among the dead bodies of their soldiers. Sometime during the night, they snuck out as the Byzantines were looting the dead, barely escaping alive to return to their capital of Ohrid. With most of his army dead or captured, the Bulgarian leader offered peace to Basil. Despite achieving a decisive victory, the emperor accepted the terms, aware that rising tensions in the east prevented him from building momentum against Bulgaria. Basil's prior expedition into Syria provoked the Fatimid caliph Al-Aziz to lead the army himself. He gathered a massive fleet to support the invasion, but luckily for the Byzantines, almost all his ships perished in a fire that broke out in the harbour. Undeterred, Al-Aziz ordered the construction of another fleet, but fate again favoured the Byzantines, as the Caliph died in 996, before he had the chance to begin the invasion. With his passing, civil war engulfed the Caliphate as the Turks and Berber factions vied for dominance. Using the Fatimid infighting, Basil replaced the ineffective Michael Burtzes with the more aggressive Damien Dallasinos. Over the next year and a half, the new Duke of Antioch succeeded in capturing several Fatimid fortifications. But his attempts to capture Tripoli faced the same obstacles that prevented Basil from capturing the city as the supplies were brought in via the sea. In early 997, Basil expanded the scope of the operations in Syria. The Byzantines assisted an anti-Fatimid revolt in the old Phoenician city of Tyre. In the meantime, a major fire broke out in the strategically important city of Apamea, destroying much of its provisions. The Duke of Antioch promptly moved to capture the city, sensing that without supplies, Apameo would surrender after a short siege. But the forces from the Emirate of Aleppo reacted faster, reaching the city first to claim it for their emir. By the time Dallasinos reached Apamea, the host from Aleppo was already encamped in front of the walls. To prevent their Muslim vassal from expanding, the Byzantines forced the Aleppans to lift the siege. The smaller Muslim host had no option but to comply, but they purposefully left their supplies in the camp as they marched off, which were soon claimed by the garrison of Apamea. With a force of around 10,000, 
Dallasinos proceeded with the plan to starve the city into submission. Meanwhile, the newly appointed governor of Damascus, Jaish ibn Samsama, was busy crushing the Byzantine-backed anti-Fatimid revolt in Tyre. After successfully entering the city, the Fatimid general moved to Damascus, taking command of an 11,000-strong relief force and heading towards Apamea. Much like four years ago, the Fatimid and Byzantine armies faced each other on the opposite banks of the Orontes River, not far from the city of Apamea. Stationed on the river's western ford, Samsama's army was divided into three main lines. The Bedouin cavalry on the left wing, under the command of a certain Mayor the Slav. A large center comprised of Iranian infantrymen, bolstered by reserve cavalry of 500 slave soldiers, under the command of Bishara the Ilkshadid. Further south, likely located on the high ground, was the right wing of the Fatimid army, commanded by the governor of Damascus himself, consisting of Berber and Bedouin horsemen. The exact Byzantine battle formation remains uncertain, however it is known that the Romans took the initiative. Their center formation was the first to ford the river and engage the Fatimid center. The well-drilled Dallasino's men quickly gained the upper hand. Fatimid infantry struggled to hold back the enemy. Their formation broke and the troops started fleeing. However, this is when the lack of discipline in the Roman ranks began to show, as many of the men broke formation to pursue the fleeing enemy, cutting down as many as 2,000. Seeing the bulk of the center fleeing, the Fatimid right and left wings followed suit. Only the feared Gilman cavalry of 500 remained in place, heroically resisting a much larger Byzantine contingent for hours. This is when a Kurdish officer from Bishara spotted Dallasinos. Seeing an opportunity to turn the tide of the battle, he rode towards the Imperial Standard. Accompanied by his two sons and his personal bodyguards, the Kurdish officer approached the small hill where the Roman general was positioned. Dallasinos, overconfident and believing that the day was won, foolishly assumed that the Kurd and his entourage were coming to surrender. The general approached the Fatimid officer and his small Gilman retinue, but before Dallasinos had the chance to speak, a Kurdish rider threw a spear at him killing him instantly. As the Duke of Antioch crumbled to the ground, the Fatimids captured his two sons. Word of the death of Dallasinos quickly made its way to the retreating Fatimid forces. Shouting, the enemy of God is dead, the Fatimids halted their retreat and turned on the Byzantines. Reinforced by the Apamean garrison that sallied forth from the fortification, Samsama managed to stabilize his line and regain the initiative. Caught out of formation, the morale of the Roman soldiers dropped and they began retreating in panic. The clash soon turned into a massacre and by the end of the day, 6,000 Byzantine troops lay strewn across the field. A very high casualty figure by medieval standards. Luckily for the Romans, Samsama did not fully exploit his victory at Apamea, having to return to Damascus to deal with internal issues. To the west, the war between the Bulgarians and Romans had resumed in 997. Once again, the emperor would be forced to deal with wars on two fronts. But it would be these challenges that would turn Basil II into the greatest emperor of the Macedonian dynasty. But more on that in the next episode. If you've made it this far into the video, thank you for watching. And if you'd like to support our work like all these amazing people do, head over to our Patreon page where you can get ad-free early access to our videos for as little as $1. Or you can support us by subscribing to our channel and leaving a comment as a sacrifice to the algorithm. As always, 
We'll see you in the next one.